Peter. I'm going to get uh, Peter Hitchens' view on him in a second. Peter, very good morning to you. Morning. Did you ever have any run-ins with uh, young Mr Prescott? No, far from it. The only time I met him was we in the green room for a BBC Question Time mm. programme. And in fact, I complimented him on an article he'd written in the in the Guardian about a, a historian called Ralph Samuel, who he'd been taught by at Ruskin College. And it's amazing the, the way he 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 beamed and preened over this because I think he was he did get very tired of being mocked as stupid, yeah. uh, which he absolutely wasn't. He right. was an extremely well educated person, and he didn't get in those days into Ruskin College. Uh, if if you were stupid, mm. uh, I don't think you do now either. But he certainly he certainly was a very bright man, also a man of the extremely hard left, uh, which people don't have, have never really understood. And uh, that that component of of what New Labour really was, mm. uh, a a nineteen sixties Oxford educated, a very near Marxist is is the thing which which John Prescott was like, like many of the other members of the New mm. Labour cabinet. Uh, as a, a, a 60s revolutionary and it, 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 there were many things about him which were likable or enjoyable but that's the thing most people sh should remember about him yeah. that he was a member of an ex of extremely hard left government uh, which did an enormous amount of damage to the country however uh, how uh, funny he may have been however much we may have in enjoyed him punching voters that's what he was Indeed, and uh, funnily enough, I was mentioning you just the other day because we were talking about uh, the whole Blair project and how um, we're now sort of living it, as it were, because this, the entire establishment, as you've said, has been kind of reformed in his image. And so now the establishment is no longer conservative with a small c. Um, it's very much a sort of left-wing, you know, academia is left-wing, uh, the civil service is left wing, you know, almost every uh, single... All the police, charities, all, charities, all the charities are left wing. Yeah, yep. I mean... The, the, Everything you, is, yeah. You have to, I mean, somebody once said to me a couple of uh, a couple of months ago, if you wanted to be a punk rocker now, you'd have to be a right winger as opposed to being a sort of anarchist because that's we are now the new anarchists. Well, it may be, but the trouble is most people don't understand what's going on, so the response to it uh, tends to be for people to be even more left wing than the, the government they're supposedly protesting against. But yeah, it's it's uh, the thing to realize about about John Prescott is that he, is that he didn't actually speak for what you might call old fashioned working class uh, Christian conservative labor, which there used to be an awful lot mm. and there is now virtually none. Uh, he spoke very much for the trade union left mm. and that's what he was there for. And uh, but because he came undoubtedly from a, a, a working class background, had been to a secondary modern school and, and worked uh, hard in a tough job, uh, that obviously made him and his politics uh, appear more accessible to the, those Labour voters who were mistrustful as they actually rightly were of exactly what Blair was on about. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, they never cottoned on. Hardly anybody is to this day has probably cottoned on to what, what Blair or rather Alistair Campbell and uh, and Gordon Brown were up to. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, that's that's all too late now. Yes, well, they were rather better at disguising it than, than Keir Starmer in the new uh, new Labour lot. Well, they don't. They just don't really feel they need to try. An yeah. awful lot of the spade work was done for them years ago, so that they don't face the levels of opposition or suspicion, or or, or indeed they don't face anything remotely resembling a conservative establishment anymore. So they they don't need to be as smart uh, or as cunning as the 1997 lot did, and as you can see, they're not as smart or as mm. cunning. No, they certainly aren't. I was reading your piece in the paper this morning with interest. Am I the last person to crave the piece of those lost Sundays when the shops were all closed and there was nothing on TV? I mean, the only uh, argument I'd have with you is there's, there's still, still nothing, nothing on, on TV. TV. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, it, was a, it doesn't seem that long ago, but it seems in some other ways like an age, a different age, doesn't it? It was, but it, 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 it collapsed very quickly. Uh, in fact, Margaret Thatcher, that well-known radical, was one of the people who tried very hard to get rid of it and was defeated on her mm. first attempt and then later got it through. But no, the, the transformation of the country from from then to now has been colossal. But as with so many of these things, once you break a, a taboo, even if it's lasted a thousand years, uh, it's it's gone it's and gone, irreplaceable. Yeah. It's been very, very hard to, to, to bring it back. And so even the poor people of Lewis, I think, 30 years ago, I imagine there's probably still a majority of people in Stornoway and the Isle of Lewis still saying, actually, we'd rather keep uh, the old Scottish Sabbath. But that's been ground down by, by 30 years of pressure from the outside world. So now when Tesco just says, oh, actually, we're going to start opening on Sundays, whether you like it or not, mm. uh, some people will oppose it, but most people will go shopping in Tesco's. And yeah. that's, that's it. It's over. And anybody who tries to go back to the previous arrangement uh, can whistle for it.
Well, the thing that I notice more uh, on a Sunday is everybody goes to the garden centre. For whatever well, that reason. Is the, that, that is the new one, one of the, the several new British religions, the National Health Service, the, the garden <laughs> centre. Yes, absolutely. It's a huge thing but it doesn't really fill the gap and the, the, the point about Sunday is it was a, it was a day off for everybody and therefore it was a family friendly day off now people scatter their time off mm. across the week and they're, they're sometimes around when the other members of their families are and sometimes not and it's it's not in fact uh, it's the, the the Western capitalist world has achieved what Stalin failed to do in the Soviet Union he tried to he tried to abolish Sunday and it was so unpopular uh, that he had to bring it back but we've now got a situation where people work in very different ways. Um, I mean, we were talking this morning about sleeplessness. There's a piece in the mail today about how Britain is a very tired country uh, because people don't get mm. enough sleep. Um, but it's partly because they're working strange hours or they're sometimes not working at all or they're sometimes working from home or sometimes they're getting on a train. You know, there's, there's a sort of very different form of society now, isn't there? Well, yes, but the, the, the whole electronic revolution has meant the work has spread into in, into everybody's evening and late night and indeed early morning if you mm. can work you often will but right. people don't feel particularly secure in their jobs and, and and therefore they will they will do this and some people just enjoy it it's it's very distracting and also the long distance commuting which has been imposed by deindustrialization where people have to travel sometimes 40 50 miles a day just to go to work mm. it's it's again into family life and private time and the fact that th these days you cannot live on one income so both parents have to go out to work uh, again everybody is distracted tired trying to do more than they've got time or energy for and it, it it's a, it's astounding that people put up with it but they they do because the alternative is generally policy but it isn't really as fantastically nice and advanced as we're led to believe it is. There the, the were things about the world 50 or 60 years ago which were preferable to the world we live in now. Yeah, absolutely right. And there's an awful lot of things that you don't work at the moment as well. I don't want to get into all of that. But let me finish up with the COVID inquiry because uh, a subject close to both of our hearts, no doubt. Uh, it's going to be the most expensive inquiry in history. £208 million pounds is the latest projected cost of it. Um, I don't really understand what it's for. Well, it's, it, it will be there, I think, to, to validate the grave mistake the government made. I confidently expected to conclude that we did not shut the country down hard enough or long enough or do our, ourselves enough damage while well, we did it. That's, uh, the idea that it was all a terrible mistake will remain known to any intelligent person who studies it. We are paying uh, for it now. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the imposition of inheritance tax on farmers uh, is part of, of the huge payment, the, the approaching... Uh, enormous increases in council tax are part of the huge payment for the ridiculous expenditure which Rishi Sunak uh, launched on the country without any money to pay for it uh, at the time of the of the Great Panic. That's that's where we are, and now we see, of course, just as we madly uh, authorised the use of, of British long-range weapons in on on Russian territory, uh, we cut our actual national defences by five hundred million. Yeah. Practically on the same again, day. Pay, pay for the COVID panic. Uh, the, 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 this is all quite extraordinary. Uh, you, you look at this country, you might, who actually is governing? Do they ever think about anything? Do they have any idea what they're doing? Do they understand even what they have done? Uh, and certainly, do they understand what they're doing? I'm astounded by the, 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 this business of giving U Ukraine permission to use long-range missiles, not necessarily because of the effect that it has, or or because I'm convinced it will lead to nuclear war, because I, I don't... I, I have to be very cautious here, because I, I, I've said that Putin would be mad to invade Ukraine. I still think he was mad to invade Ukraine, mm -hmm. and I, I'm not going to say anything about whether or not he might use nuclear weapons, because how can we tell? But what, I, what is the really f totally significant development in this, I certainly with the Americans, and I think with our missiles as well, these cannot be used without the involvement of our service personnel. Right. That is to say, what, what's happening is the, is the weapons from the United States and from Britain, under the control of British and American servicemen who answer to the British and American governments, are firing weapons into Russian sovereign territory. Now, we are at war with Russia, as far as I know. No declaration of war has been made. No. Ukraine's at war with Russia. But this is, a, this is an extraordinarily uh, risky step, whichever way you look at it. And I was fascinated by the response of the, of the American government uh, to what they had themselves done, which was to order all their embassy staff in Kiev to go home and to yeah. close the embassy. Right. What, do they, what do they think might happen? It's not very hard to work out what, how their minds went through it and what they thought might be the limits of a Russian response. Mm. 
And looking at b events both in Ukraine and the Middle East, you can see why it crossed their mind that their embassy in Kiev might no longer be safe. So I, I, I think that we are in, in, in this extraordinary dangerous minefield here. And so I'm talking of minefields, by the way, where is Princess Diana when you well, meet her? I mean, and the, whole, the whole of the world was totally against landmines. Yeah. Uh, except, as it happened to me, I said they, they were... They well, Britain has well, signed well, up to the, to the UN Convention, you know, but, but nobody in the British government is willing to criticise America for giving landmines, which we apparently oppose, to Ukraine, who are also not signed up to it. But it's, it's, it was such a universal opinion. The same with cluster, uh, cluster yeah. munitions, which are also uh, uh, permitted to be used in, uh, by the Ukrainians. On this matter, uh, we totally take leave of our senses. We don't look at anything we ever said before, any principles we pretend to have had. And it, here we are saying, well, we must carry on helping Ukraine. Well, before all this started, Ukraine was a sovereign country, a functioning democracy, reasonably prosperous and happy, uh, at peace with its neighbours. And then we started helping Ukraine. And it's, since then, it's become a, a battlefield, a graveyard, and, 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 a, and a sea of destruction, uh, constantly under bombardment from Russia, losing its young men. If, if that's what happens when we help you, then I, if, if I were a Ukrainian, I might say, let's not have any more help. Absolutely right.